Ready Player One is a well-done character-driven story, mired in a shitstorm of exposition. The story follows an 18-year-old Wade Watts living in the hellish 2040s. Due to real life sucking, most people escape their lives by living in Oasis, basically the internet too. Wade is a gunter, who is an Oasis user who devotes most of his free time to searching for Halliday's Easter Egg, because the Easter Egg is Halliday's will, and the first person who finds it will become the wealthiest and most powerful person on Earth. By the time of the book's beginning, Halliday's been dead for around half a decade, with no progress being made on the Easter egg hunt because the first of the three keys hasn't been found. And already we have issue one with the book, The Relentless Exposition. As much as I just want to do a simple review of the book, you need to know a lot of context for any of it to make sense. And not just context of the book, you also need to know context of anything 80s related. D&D, anime, retro video games, movies, and music. And the thing is, some of the nostalgia jerking of Mr. Ernest Cline, the man who wrote the book, is actually relevant to the plot, so you can't just ignore it. Especially if it's D&D or retro video game related. The book at times is just listing off reference after reference, like an encyclopedia. It's overbearing at best and degrading at worst. If I wanted to read a book about 1980s culture, I would have bought a book about 1980s culture. I bought this book because I wanted to read a story. Speaking of which, I actually don't have that many complaints about it. When Klein pulls his bootstraps and actually focuses on the plot and the characters, the book isn't that bad. The premise is simple and the plot is predictable, though it is engaging, which is what the book needs to be at the end anyway. Starting with the actual world itself, on the surface it just seems to be another typical cyberpunk dystopia. Everything is high-tech, there's an energy crisis, food shortages, abandoned cars laying around, and everyone is poor. In the beginning of the book, Atomic Blast are mentioned by Wade nonchalantly as a normal headline, which you'd assume would start a massive war or at least create a post-apocalyptic hellscape, or at least something. But nope, most people still have access to electricity, an internet connection, and the US government is still a functioning body. Literally, starvation is a bigger threat to you in this world than, you know, being blown up by the bombs. Though the book does explain it away. When Wade moves from Oklahoma City to Columbus, the rural land become Mad Max. He mentions that there were guards stationed on his bus to fight off traveling gangs of raiders. Which makes sense for about two seconds once you realize that the US government has no control over rural lands. How is only starvation a problem? How are American cities functioning at all if they don't have control of the resources outside of their city limits? The raiders at the countryside probably can't sustain themselves off of the resources they do have access to, no less an overpopulated city nearby. How the fuck is Wade ordering a pizza? This is just a single issue of the real world. This is not even mentioning anything related to the Oasis. Speaking of which, Oasis is basically a mix of Gary's Mod, VR Chat, the monetization of Roblox, the graphics of Red Dead 2, and the expansiveness of the internet itself. That's a pretty good summary of Oasis. Though, beyond the already listed, all of the features that Oasis have make no fucking sense. In the book, it is explained that each explorable world in the Oasis is something which is of a planetary scale. Ludus, for example, is about one-fourth of the size of the Earth's moon, with the whole planet being explorable. This is in spite of the fact that the only purpose of the planet is to act as Zoom slash Google Classroom. And if you wanted to travel between identical campuses, you couldn't just switch servers. You either had to fast travel, which costed in-game and thus real-world money, or go on virtual foot to get from location to location. Why? That's such a waste of computing power. And it's mentioned several times throughout the book that there is an energy crisis. Think about the amount of electricity being wasted so Ludus can simulate parts of a planet that aren't being used anyways. Multiply that over to every virtual planet and virtual chat room which can be fully fleshed out with decorations and fully simulated comic books. And on top of that, the normal internet still exists as well! It gets even dumber as each world is separated by vast expanses of virtual outer space which can take up hours of real world time to travel across. Imagine how much memory is just being taken up because the computer has to keep up with all the locations of every piece of floating debris in the virtual void. And most times it also costs money to go from one planet to another. Which ironically is a scummier business practice than what IOI was planning to implement into Oasis. Imagine if you were playing Roblox but every time you wanted to switch which game or server you were playing you had to pay a certain amount of Robux depending on which game you came from and which game you wanted to head to. And to add to that, the games which were more expensive to get to also took longer to get to since there was a literal distance you had to cross to get to the other game instead of just hopping out of a server and hopping into another one. In Oasis, if you wanted access to other planets or galaxies or sectors, you had to shill out in-game currency to buy or build a spaceship and had to purchase fuel for said spaceship. And even then, occasionally, you'd have to pay for taxi fares because depending on if you 
you are magic or tech based, your shit won't work properly because the galaxy you're in doesn't permit tech or magic to function. Also, there is no way that GSS is a profitable company in the 2040s. Most software companies today bleed money, even with high amounts of traffic because of how expensive server upkeep is. No less having a generous estimate that 4 out of your 5 servers are just undeveloped virtual wasteland. And then you have to tackle the fact that in this world, most people are impoverished and cannot afford, if any, in-game currency. Unironically, IOI's plan would be better financially for both the company and the consumer. Actually, ignoring the illegal spying, indentured servitude, obstructions of justice, and domestic terrorism, IOI is probably a more ethical company than GSS. Another thing which bothers me about the book is that the author cannot do simple fucking math, or he just retcons the timeline every couple of chapters. The book is set in early 2045, with the exception of the back. Alright, so that could just be a typo. James Halliday was born in 1972 and died at the age of 67, meaning that he died in 2039. In the book, everyone refers to his death as 5 years ago. And I shouldn't be throwing rocks because I act like 2018 was 2 years ago. But then, we get to the age of Wade. In the book, several times it is made clear that Wade is a teenager who is still in high school, specifically 18. But then, Nolan Sorrento states that Wade was born in August of 2024 which would make Wade 20 by the events of the book. So either Wade was actually born in August of 2026, or the story is actually set in February of 2043, not February of 2045. But then, at the end of the book, Wade claims to be 22 despite the fact that at most only a year and a half has passed since the story's beginning. Which would mean that if he was 18 by the novel's start, he would have been 19 turning 20 by the novel's end, or 21 turning 22, not 22 turning 23. Also, in the several years since the beginning of the hunt, how has no one ever thought of data mining or looking into the coding of Oasis to find the easter egg, or at least the instructions to find it? The closest real world equivalent I can think of would be 2B2T. You're telling me that for 5 years some pop bob like figure didn't backdoor the system, or Halliday or Ogden's accounts, and took the fortune for himself? You're telling me that IOI or another in-universe tech giant didn't just look into the coding of the game to find the easter egg? Why is a major corporation spending real life liquid assets assets to buy in-game equipment to fight other players. When the first key was found, why not just recode the labyrinth so it was only available to IOI members? Actually, game devs were able to alter the code. After Ludus became a major battleground, Oasis devs just made a new planet with the only difference being that the dungeon was removed. As scummy as all of this sounds, in the book it would still be a valid claim to Halliday's estates, even if you cheated your way there, as there were no rules on how to obtain the egg. Lastly, how is GSS a stable company? Early on in the book, in an exposition dump, it is mentioned that GSS is a publicly traded company. And I don't know about you, but I wouldn't put my money in a company which sacrifices future leadership to a video game easter egg hunt. But if you ignore all of this, the overbearing 80s nostalgia jerking, the logistical impossibilities of Oasis, Wade's inconsistent age, and so on. I mean it's alright! As far as my reading palette goes, Ready Player One is a very character driven story. In the beginning of the book, Wade is a lonely loser, living with his abusive aunt, and at the end he got a girl and learned what life was really all about. SHOW US THE TIPS! So, if you're not sick of the 80s nostalgia, and you're fine reading paragraphs on top of paragraphs about obscure Dungeons and Dragons lore, and a transcript of 1983's War Games and 1975's Monty Python and the Holy Grail, go right ahead. 4 out of 10. This has been Mr. Agent Pie. See you on the flip, and don't be stupid.